Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. This month's program is about current space robotic missions. There are four missions in all that we're going to cover during this show, and to uh, help me out with that is, once again, our own Stephen Witte. Glad to be here, Don. All right, well, the first one we're going to talk about is New Horizons. Uh, this mission is to help us with understanding Pluto, uh, one of the ice dwarf objects out in the Kuiper Belt. Uh, this will help us with our knowledge of solar system building and uh, planetary formation. So, New Horizons, um, how's it doing? Uh, it's doing great. Uh, they recently had a, um, uh, a wake-up event. So it had been in hibernation for, uh, uh, for some time, like a year. And uh, they've woken it up, and uh, the systems are at checkout, and they're, uh, they're on course to Pluto. Great. Uh, I know that starting uh, this past January, just last month, they were using some of those observations for course correction. But uh, regular observations are starting uh, this month, and uh, they say that by May, some of these uh, images will be better than the ones off the Hubble. That's right. Yeah, as they get closer, um, they've got this eight-inch eight-inch diameter telescope, LORI, uh, and uh, uh, when they get close enough, it'll outperform the Hubble, which is of course much farther away. Very big, but yes, much much farther away. Now they're going to have a six-month intensive period of study as it approaches Pluto and Charon, its uh, largest moon. The uh, closest approach is set for uh, this coming July on the 14th. Right, right. So um, uh, New Horizons isn't going to orbit Pluto, it's going to do a flyby. And so it's going to take images on the way to Pluto, it's actually going to turn around and as it continues with its momentum, uh, heading way past Pluto, it is also going to uh, be taking images from, uh, from the other side. And, and studying some of those other Kuiper Belt objects. Well, that's, that's in the follow-on mission. In the follow-on mission, uh, uh, they've actually uh, picked, uh, they came up with a couple candidates, and they've actually picked a candidate to, uh, to have New Horizons head to. Uh, but way before they get that far, because that is quite a, quite a ways, um, they're going to be spending quite a long time uh, sending the data back from uh, when they were both approaching Pluto and when they were leaving Pluto, all of that stuff, they don't have time to actually send that data. They'll be sending that uh, after they've gone far enough beyond Pluto that uh, getting new data isn't going to be as worthwhile. Now we have some images uh, concerning the New Horizons mission? Yeah, we have some, sure. Um, so first of all, we had the launch. The launch of uh, New Horizon was on a, an Atlas V. And, uh, Back in 2006. That's right, yeah. And uh, it took off like a, like a bat. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, so I remember they, they, they talked about how it passed the moon faster than any other mission. And you might think, oh, well, then it's going really fast and it'll, it'll uh, eventually overtake the Voyagers, especially Voyager 1. And that doesn't turn out to be true. Um, Voyager 1 uh, came by Jupiter closer than New Horizons did. And so it's going to be going faster. It's already going faster than uh, New Horizons will ever go. Great. And the next image up is? So uh, this is uh, an artist's rendition of um, the um, Pluto and Charon uh, pair, right? So you've got this. Uh, binary you, planet. System sort, of a, yeah. sort of a binary yeah. planet, yeah. Uh, Charon is even bigger compared to Pluto than the moon is compared to Earth. And some, some planetary scientists even call the Earth Moon a, a binary planet. Mm -hmm. uh, Next up. Okay, so uh, this is a ground based image of Pluto and Charon. Uh, it's probably the best that we've done uh, from the ground. It's using um, the Shara array, uh, which is an interferometer uh, on the ground. Okay. And uh, so you, you synthesize. Uh, the effect of having a very large diameter telescope by using two relatively small telescopes. Okay. Um, and yeah. this right here is the New Horizons craft? That's right. So that's more or less uh, what it will look like. It's an artist's conception as it passes uh, Pluto. So you see Sharon in the background. Again, we don't know what these look like yet because we haven't been there. Um, except that we do know kind of an overall color for Pluto and we do 
uh, so it's got a little reddish tint, which they showed. We, we don't know anything about the details of, I, I don't think. We'll have to follow up uh, sometime after July this year with That's right. some of that data. And this right here? This is a, a, a map of the, the, um, the, the trip out, right? So uh, they don't actually show the Jupiter encounter. Or Jupiter, uh, it actually swung by Jupiter and got a gravity assist. Uh, and it uh, passed the orbit of Neptune, although it's not going toward Neptune at all, um, to reach Pluto directly. And so this is where it will bring us up, like I say, coming up uh, July 14th. Yeah, and at the bottom of that uh, map there was a little red line that continued, and that's its continuing mission past Pluto uh, to get to a Kuiper Belt object. All right, good. Um, so, like I said, uh, we'll have some updates uh, concerning uh, the... Uh, Mission New Horizons. Uh, hopefully, in our August show, uh, we'll have something to uh, to bring to you about yeah. this exciting mission. Maybe we'll have uh, an early image when it's uh, you know after May, when the images are actually better than the Hubble images that we've yeah. seen. That'll be interesting to try and do. Well, we're going to move on to our next mission, uh, Curiosity. As a matter of fact, there's an image of the Mars Science Laboratory slash Curiosity on the Martian surface. Yeah, this is a self-portrait. Uh, it's hard to imagine, but um, one of the arms has uh, a camera, and by taking the picture of itself from various angles, they can not only get all of the rover, they can get even a good section of the arm that uh, has the camera on it to, to edit show that out. If, and they've edited it out, but they could actually show that. Because uh, I was looking in the front there, there seems to be some little divots. I thought those might have been the footprints of the LGMs who were taking the photo. But no. <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't think so. I don't know if they're green on, on Mars, are they? <laughs> a little green then? <laughs> Perhaps not. But uh, Curiosity is a 23-month, uh, or has a 23-month primary mission to uh, study the past environment on Mars to see if it was conducive to support microbial life. Yeah, and for microbial life you need, uh, we think that we, we need water and you need some, uh, some uh, basic organic chemistry. Organic chemistry is basically anything that reacts with carbon. Right. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, so Curiosity almost immediately uh, discovered evidence of not just water but running water, a stream bed. And, uh, uh, so that part of the mission is pretty much uh, uh, sealed up. All right. Um, we have some additional uh, pictures here of the Martian surface. Uh, this is uh, Gale Crater with uh, Mount Sharp or Yeah, Mons, yeah so there's a little ellipse there, a little uh, uh, oval shape. And that's, that was the, la the landing ellipse. And in this shot, uh, uh, Curiosity actually uh, uh, ended up sort of toward the left, mostly toward the left, and actually mostly toward the destination. Um, Curiosity, uh, Curiosity actually backed up a little bit to find a, a, to see, look at a, an interesting local shot uh, near the landing before turning around and heading to the mountain. Uh, this shot is the first uh, trek. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but uh, it, it actually, from, um, uh, from orbit, uh, it actually shows the the, the first uh, uh, tracks, the Curiosity, which is Is this is from that, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter? That's right. Okay. Yeah, MRO uh, uh, has great resolution. And this is uh, a shot of some of the uh, rock drilling to collect samples? Yeah, the first hole gave us really good evidence of clays that would have been formed in this, lake stream, in this uh, stream bed. Okay. And the next image? Uh, so this is the, the trek... Uh, mostly the trek so far up, up on the top, the rover is going sort of down and to the left, and, uh, and you can just barely see uh, a continuing trek on the lower left. Uh, that's the future. So at the moment, we're more or less down, uh, uh, down at the... Parham Hills there? Yeah. Okay. Now this is interesting because I know that they discovered for a period of time a, a big spike in the methane levels there where Curiosity was. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, when Curiosity uh, landed, uh, its methane detector, which is very sensitive, found nothing, really nothing. And they said, well, we're not seeing the methane that we saw uh, that was detected from Earth, uh, from the mighty Keck in Hawaii. Um, so, um, you know, it's like, where is it? 
And, and I thought, well, like, where did they detect it from the Keck? And it turns out to be on the other side of the planet. Oh, okay. So, but uh, more recently, um, uh, Curiosity had, uh, had these spikes where the amount of methane that was detected went up by a factor of 10 uh, briefly, just very briefly, just for a day or so. Okay, and they determined using the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that there are no Martian cows? Not, not any Martian cows, no. Okay. No, a cow actually would show up. It's pretty funny yeah. that, that you could see a cow from space, but yeah, okay. uh, you can see the tracks from space. Okay, well that covers our first two missions that we're going to talk about in this show. Uh, if you'd like to get some additional information, check our website. Uh, we always show that at the bottom of your screen. There it is right there. And uh, we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to present Term of the Month, and when we come back, We'll have more on our current space robotic missions. The term of the month for February 2015 is Comet, and I chose this term because I don't think I've used it before and because this month we have a naked eye comet, Comet Lovejoy. Uh, Lovejoy was a naked eye comet in January and certainly early February. Although it is getting fainter, it is expected to stay naked eye through most of the month. So, what is a comet? Well, comets have a nucleus, and the nucleus um, can be anywhere from tens of meters to thousands of meters in diameter. They can be huge or they can be relatively small. They are small, icy objects, and, and what happens is that when they approach the sun and they get warmer, the ice turns directly from a a solid into a gas. It, they, the ice sublimates and this can form jets. And the jets have not just the gas from the ice but also has whatever dust happens to be hanging around. So what we're looking at here is Comet Hartley um, with a, new, a number of jets on one side of it. Now uh, comets also have tails and these tails Maybe there may be one or more tails. Uh, typically, uh, the gas and dust uh, that uh, get shot off in the jets, uh, as they get farther from the uh, the comet, and the solar wind from the sun, this this solar wind pushes on the gas and dust. Uh, it can push easier on the gas, forming one tail, and uh, the dust doesn't go as far so it forms a separate tail. So you have the dust tail and you have the gas or sometimes called the ion uh, tail. A uh, study of comet tails led to the discovery of the solar wind. Now Comet uh, Lovejoy, when you look for it, it's just going to be a fuzzball in the sky. To see the tail you'll need a telescope, you may even need a time exposure to see the tail. Now comet orbits, uh, comets orbit in anything from a few years uh, to millions of years, they're orbiting the sun. Lovejoy came in on an 11,000 year comet, uh, uh, orbit. Uh, it will leave on an 8,000 year orbit, and that's because of interactions with uh, gravity of planets. So that's comets, uh, the term of the month for February 2015. Um, go take a look for it. Welcome back. We're continuing our discussion on current space robotic missions. And again, with me is Stephen Witte. Uh, our next mission is by the European Space Agency. This is the Rosetta mission to a comet. Yes, that's right. So the comet, uh, the easy way to pronounce it is 67P. Uh, the comet is churyumov gerasimenko so these are the two Russians that uh, discovered it uh, way back when, and uh, so we're stuck with it. There it is. 
Uh, this mission was actually launched almost 11 years ago, back in 2004. So it's taken quite a while for it to uh, catch up. Yes, that's right. So uh, the, the trip out there was uh, quite involved. It went by some asteroids, which we'll get to. Uh, what we have here is Rosetta, the mission, the, the spacecraft, with uh, Philae, which is the, uh, the lander that actually landed on the comet. Uh, so we'll get to that in a bit. Too. Just a little bit. You mentioned it did go by a couple of uh, asteroids on its way out. Yeah, that's right. So the first asteroid that it managed to get to is Letitia, uh, and it looks pretty good from here. They got, to, they got some really good imagery. And then the other one was Steins. Uh, they didn't get as close to Steins, so um, the Steins image isn't as good. It looks a little fuzzy. Uh, we can bring that up. Um, you know, don't adjust your set. Uh, so this is Letitia, and then the next one is Steins, uh, which, is, which is the fuzzier one. Uh, oh, all right. there we are. All right. So, um, so uh, we didn't get as close to Steins, it's, uh, and so this is the best that we could do. Still, uh, we learned quite a bit about, from, uh, about Steins as well on the, on the flyby. Now, Phil I the lander actually made contact with the surface of the comet back on November 12th and uh, was going to try to anchor itself to the surface. Yeah, so it had several anchoring mechanisms. It had, uh, the feet actually had little uh, screws that would screw into the comet. They failed. Uh, there was also a harpoon that uh, was shot at the comet and that was supposed to anchor, you know, sort of, it was a, a harpoon on a, on a rope, on a tether, and it was supposed to reel it in and, and, and that also failed. And uh, so uh, Philae bounced off of the uh, comet. Uh, it's thought to have bounced almost a mile high because the gravity is very low. Mm -hmm. And it came back down. So it came back down further than was, uh, you know, was planned. And uh, uh, it is thought to have landed in a crevice. Um, it was able to take pictures and get data for uh, over an hour which were transmitted back to the mothership, uh, but um, uh, it didn't have any uh, sunlight for its uh, solar cells. Right, the solar panels. Yeah. So it is currently, uh, um, in some sense, dead, although it is still possible that as the comet gets closer to the sun, that area of the comet will get lit up and Philae could come back to life. Well, it's still possible. Let's hope so, because part of the mission is to study uh, for the chemical composition and uh, amino acids being one of those. Yeah, right. So, um, sure. So, uh, this image we've got, we're talking about the chirality or the handedness of chemicals. So you can have a left-handed sugar and a right-handed sugar, and it's just a, sort of a mirror image. And life has uh, gone with one-handedness of chemicals. So we expect the, chem the chemicals uh, in the absence of life to all have sort of random left or right handedness and that's what we're uh, hoping to uh, analyze, uh, one of the things that we're hoping to analyze. Also they have found that the uh, water mo molecules uh, on, uh, on this comet 67P are different than the water mo molecules here on Earth. Yeah, this, that's um, um, basically uh, the amount of deuterium in the water mo molecules. So deuterium is a, um, uh, an isotope of hydrogen. It has an extra neutron, and uh, so it's a little heavier. And you expect a certain amount, and you, we, we measure what we have on the Earth, and we measure something different on the comet. So uh, at, least, at least this family of comets uh, doesn't look like it is a source of uh, Earth's water. So Earth's water may have come from some other mechanism, and that would be interesting to know, certainly. Absolutely. Now, are there any other images? I think we just saw one a moment ago of the, uh, the comet being lit up with a tail. Yeah, so um, when, the, when the comet gets closer to the sun, uh, uh, the gases, the, there, are a number of, uh, there are a number of chemicals that will uh, turn to gas. They'll, uh, go from uh, solid to gas immediately, and so they'll sort of explode or go off in jets from the from the nucleus, and they carry dust with them uh, into space, and that forms uh, actually a twin tail. You have a, a dust tail and uh, 
a um, and a gas tail and a gas tail. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we do have one more mission that we want to get to in the minutes that we have left in this segment. Of course, that's the Dawn mission uh, from NASA going to asteroid Vesta and minor or dwarf planet Ceres. Yeah. So this is a. Uh, a a surface map of Vesta from the observations uh, that, that Dawn made. And it's not that important what the colors mean, uh, but uh, what, it, what is important is that we've studied different regions and, and what they, how they behave chemically. And what do we have here in this image? Uh, so this I believe is, that's Vesta. Yeah, that is Vesta. So uh, we're, we're, we're not seeing the whole uh, circle because of uh, the lighting angle from the sun. Uh, 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 you do get uh, some details. There were some interesting uh, 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 sort of valley net networks, and uh, it was some uh, craters there. Yeah, and certainly craters. Mm -hmm. But there were some things that weren't expected. There's a huge crater in the south pole of Vesta, and uh, it may have uh, caused some structure changing of the entire uh, um, uh, small planet or planetoid. And I think they estimate even that uh, that material that was blasted out, uh, that material accounts for about 5% of all the meteorites found here on Earth. It's, yeah, yeah. The, the Vesta uh, uh, asteroids are, or meteorites are uh, uh, identifiable from their chemical composition. Now, we're approaching Ceres as we speak here in, in February. That's right. Yeah, we're, we get there pretty soon. And uh, this is a, sort of a distant, distant fuzzy shot. Yeah, this is a Hubble Space Telescope shot. Um, there is a little whitish spot uh, toward the top of the image, and uh, as Ceres, as Dawn has gotten closer to Ceres, this uh, white spot has gotten brighter. Uh, uh, so that's uh, uh, an interesting thing that uh, that we're looking forward to learning about. Well, and of course, then uh, the uh, Dawn mission will go into orbit around Ceres uh, next month in March, uh, the sixth, I believe. And so that should make for some interesting science and images. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So we'll learn some chemical composition. We expect the whole surface is more or less ice, maybe with a dust cover. If you have a, uh, a little, uh, little asteroid or a little meteor hit, make a little crater. Uh, if it's a young crater, you might get a bright spot like we see. Mm -hmm. So that might be a young crater. Uh, so you're seeing the ice, uh, naked ice rather than uh, uh, dust covered ice. Well, this covers our four missions that we have uh, today. We'll uh, try and bring you updates on these missions as we progress through 2015, and certainly with New Horizons and Pluto. Uh, we can't wait to get those images to you. Uh, we're going to wrap up uh, this part of the program for today. If you have any questions, uh, please send us an email, the address of which is uh, down there on the bottom of your screen. And coming up next is Stephen Witte with What's Up. Thanks, Don. Uh, this is What's Up for February 2015. Uh, the moon's in February. Uh, February 3rd uh, it starts with a full moon. February 11th, we have the third quarter, so it's up after midnight. February 18th, it, we have the new moon. And February 25th is the first quarter, so uh, an, an evening uh, uh, moon. Sunrise through the month, uh, the month starts at sunrise of about 7.46, and by, by month's end it's 7.10, so uh, the days start earlier. Sunset starts, uh, start, the month starts with a sunset at 5.47 p.m. and ends with a 6.21 p.m. sunset. So this is basically Michigan. The days are getting longer, we're getting farther from uh, the winter solstice. February 3rd is kind of an interesting day. It's a cross-quarter day called Imolk. Uh, this is an old holiday. It's not celebrated much anymore. Uh, there is also a Feast of St. Bridget, which is not celebrated too much anymore. Uh, Groundhog Day is more or less the cross-quarter day. This year it is celebrated February 2nd. Uh, see the 1993 movie for details. Uh, Venus sets uh, between 7.40 and 8.40 throughout the month. Um, so here we have Venus, and we've got crosshairs showing where Neptune is. The two on the, first of, uh, on the first of the month, 
the two planets are visually apart about half again the width of the full moon. So they're not very far apart. They can easily be both seen in binoculars or a small telescope. Uh, so Venus and Mars, uh, Venus and Neptune. Neptune is very hard to see uh, without a finder chart, but this is uh, an interesting spot. Uh, Venus is pretty easy to spot, and uh, so we're looking at this uh, uh, you know, shortly after sunset, maybe 6.30, maybe 7. And then we have Mars a little higher in the sky. Uh, Mars is with us for another month or two. Um, next up we have, uh, we just sort of zoom out and you can see Venus with, well, you can't really see even Neptune there. And then above it you, you can see Mars. But toward the top uh, we have Uranus. So Uranus isn't naked eye. You'll need at least binoculars to see it. Uh, but it's more or less in a line with Venus and uh, Mars sort of pointing the way. Uh, you'll probably need a finer chart for that. Jupiter, um, this is a, a February 3rd shot of Jupiter. So uh, the more or less full moon is right next to Jupiter. You won't be, it won't be hard to spot Jupiter next to, uh, even without the moon. Uh, but I just thought this would be a, a cool thing. Jupiter is in opposition February 6th, so pretty much all month Jupiter is up in the sky all night. Saturn rises at 3 in the morning uh, at the beginning of the month and at 1.30 in the morning by the end of the month. Here it is uh, with the moon uh, mid-month. Um, anyway, Saturn is a great sight and um, uh, it's uh, uh, worth, worth uh, being up in the early morning for the clear skies. We also have a naked eye comet, Lovejoy. I'll be talking about that uh, momentarily. So that's what's up in the night sky for February 2015.